Hello, I'm Michelle Skinner, and I will be talking about the founding of the Chickasha Public Library in 1905, as well as three women who were instrumental in that founding. And I will also be describing my slides, just because I don't know if anyone else is visually impaired and could benefit from a screen description. So on the first slide, we have pictures of three ladies. They are Stella Brown, Frances Hamilton, and Sally Thompson. And the background is a document from 1904 about the first, with the first meeting of the Carnegie Library Committee, in which actually was where the library started to develop. So um, Chickasha, Oklahoma, formerly an Indian territory, it's a community of around 17,000 people currently. It is located in Grady County and is part of the Chickasaw Nation. It was founded as a railroad town in 1892 and was for the first two years of its existence centered mainly around the railroads and agriculture. At that time, the population was around two to 3,000 people. The population began to increase at the turn of the 20th century with many people coming into Chickasha to work. And at the time, several local women's organizations saw the need for permanent establishments that would enhance the civic and cultural life of the community. Several members of the Chickasha chapters of, of the Sorosis Study Club, which was founded in 1896, realized that this community needed a library, and so they began a newspaper campaign to bring the idea to the public. Other women's organizations that were active in Chickasha during that time also joined the library promotion effort. As the idea grew, other residents and business leaders began supporting a public library, which they saw as a sign of cultural and intellectual pro progress within the community. Because of the multifaceted and far-reaching efforts of volunteer women's organizations, the Carnegie Library was established in 1905 as the first free library in Indian Territory and has been serving the community ever since. The library's current building was completed on the same site in 1964 and renamed the Chickasha Public Library, where it is now in its 118th year of operation. Today I will be talking about three women who were each involved with the library's beginnings and how their unique contributions enabled the library to flourish. The first person I'll be talking about is Stella Brown. And on this slide, there's a photograph of Stella Brown, as well as a photo of her house and some information about her. She was the Federation of Women's Clubs and was from a very socially prominent family in the community. Also, there's a photograph of her house, and I have to mention that I pass her house every morning on the way to work. I also slipped on the ice on the way to work one morning. That wasn't as fun, but um, it's a beautiful house. According to her obituary, quote, Mrs. Brown was a Chickasaw Indian by descent and was one of the best educated woman, women of her tribe. She was born near Tishomingo in an Indian seminary. For two years, Mrs. Brown was president of the Oklahoma CWBM Society of the Christian Church. End quote. The obituary further says that, quote, she was the wife of John W. Brown, one of the wealthiest Indian citizens of that city, end quote, and that, quote, her people have been prominent in Chickasaw Indian tribal affairs for years. Her cousin, Holmes Colbert, spends most of his time in Washington, D.C., attending to matters pertaining to the Chickasaw interests, end quote. Stella Brown used her considerable influence and her civic leadership to advocate for a public library, which began with the newspaper campaign. Many articles were written in the Chickasha Daily Express in the earliest years of the 20th century by volunteer women from around 1900 to 1902, explaining the, the benefits of a library is eventually winning public support for the idea. And this slide shows one of the many newspaper articles that were written at that time. They were opinion pieces and they were written by volunteers to tell the community why a library was not only feasible but necessary. Three women's clubs, the Sorosa Study Club, New Century Club, and the Chautauqua Circle, with the support of Mayor R.F. Scoffrin, requested a grant from Andrew Carnegie in 1903 for the purpose of building a public library. They received the grant and immediately formed the Carnegie Library Committee. They began fundraising, secured the land, purchased the land, and solicited book donations. Stella Brown told the newspaper that, quote, the word fail has been taken out of our vocabulary in this as well as all other matters that relate to the welfare of our city. And this slide shows a photograph of the opening of the Carnegie Library on March 23, 1905, and a photo of the exterior of that library. 
When the library was dedicated on March 23rd, 1905, Reverend J.D. Bowen delivered the principal address and then handed the key of the building to the library board. Stella Brown was the first president of that board, and when she resigned in 1906 for health reasons, she wrote that, quote, it has now been more than three years since my connection with the work of the Carnegie Library, and we have succeeded so far in making it a great success, and the relations between the members and myself have always been of the most pleasant character, end quote. Among other things, Stella Brown also donated a china cabinet to the library. Her obituary in 1911 also highlighted her library involvement, saying that, quote, she was one of the foremost citizens in securing of the Carnegie Library for Chickasha. By her work and influence, the library was located, built, and maintained. And the second person we'll be talking about is Francis Hamilton. At the library's dedication in March 1905, Francis Manby Hamilton, who lived from 1860 to 1919, greeted citizens as they arrived. She was originally from England and was the wife of, wife of Reverend Eugene Hamilton. They moved to Chickasha in the 1880s, where Eugene Hamilton served as the first minister of the First Presbyterian Church, which was founded in 1892. Fun fact, I play piano and organ there every Sunday. So I thought that was a very delightful fact. Francis Hamilton was very involved in a variety of civic organizations and was also well known in the community as a prominent library supporter. She was a member of the Federation of Women's Clubs, as well as an accomplished pianist who spoke German, Italian, and French. Frances Hamilton and her husband helped to organize the First Presbyterian Church, which is located across the street from the library. And she somehow found time to develop the library at the same time. So all of her efforts were purely volunteer and purely for the love of her community. And this slide shows her photograph. And she greeted library visitors, and so her photograph is now in a historic display where she can continue to greet people coming into the library today. So that always makes me smile. Okay. So the last person I'll be talking about is Sally Thompson. The first librarian at the Carnegie Library was Sally Luce Trice Thompson, who was also known as Mrs. J.A. Thompson in many documents and paperwork. She graduated from high school in Decatur, Texas in 1889, and then studied at Baylor University. She had been an elementary school teacher in Texas for seven years before moving to Oklahoma in 1903 with her husband, Joseph A. Thompson, who owned at meat, a meat market in Chickasha, as well as and their son, Wallace Thompson. Sally Thompson answered an ad placed in the Chickasha Daily Express on May 16, 1905 that read, quote, librarian and janitor needed for the new library and was unanimously chosen by the library board in August 1905. Her initial salary is $40 per month. Sally Thompson served as the library in Carnegie Library during three separate time periods, from 1905 to 1907, from 1910 to 1916, and then from 1923 to 1929. For the first several years of the Carnegie Library's operation, Sally Thompson almost single-handedly ran the library, advocating for funding and donations. She developed the collection, and communicated regularly with community members about the services and resources that were provided. She was described as by Chickasha resident Mary Bailey, who was quoted in Gwen Jackson's research as, quote, a dear soul, small in, small in stature and plainly dressed, end quote, who was always determined to keep the library open, even during months when she wasn't paid because of limited funds. Sally Thompson was an active member of both the Oklahoma Library Association and the American Library Association, and she frequently traveled to other libraries and to library conferences to learn more about the latest books and technology and how to better serve the community. And on her slide, it shows her photograph, as well as the first page of the accession records that shows the very first books that were acquired by the library, and they were all through donations. In 1908, Sally Thompson wrote in one of her frequent newspaper articles, quote, this is the library age. Libraries have come to stay. It seems strange to us that any of our forefathers should have questioned the advantages of the free public school system. So it will seem strange to our children that anyone should question the practical utility of a properly administered public library. The future Commonwealth of Oklahoma will be called upon to pro provide for the culture and training of her citizens. There is no single agency that meets the demand more effectively and economically than a state library commission. As Chickasha was the pioneer library builder in the territory, so she may take the initiative in securing statewide provision for good reading. 
By 1914, Sally Thompson reported to the Chickasha Daily Express that the library had already paid a 500% return on investment for the residents of Chickasha in its nine years of operation. In 1906, Sally Thompson helped to start a library branch at the Lincoln School in Chickasha, which she described as, quote, a valued and much appreciated addition to the year's work. Before the middle of the 20th century, Jim Crow laws in Oklahoma were in effect and white lawmakers prohibited African Americans from using public libraries. In 1911, Oklahoma session laws mandated that separate libraries and reading rooms be established in town whose African American population was more than a thousand people. The library board had tried to establish the branch for 15 years, but no appropriation of funds had been made by the city council. <coughs> Although books had been donated to the Lincoln School for several years, this was the first time it became an official library branch. Sally Thompson wrote that, quote, the legal obligation of the city to supply library services to the Negro citizens has been settled by court in several Oklahoma towns. There's also a moral obligation, and those who believe in the wholesome influence of books ought to dis discharge it. The Negro citizens have waited patiently, and I made reasonable requests for books at the desk in the city library, end quote. The Lincoln School Library Branch served Chickasha's black community until the mid 20th century when schools and libraries were integrated and the Carnegie Library of Chickasha could finally fulfill its duty to serve the entire community. Sally Thompson officially retired in 1929 after having <coughs> contributed greatly to the growth and development of the Carnegie Library. According to Oklahoma Libraries 1900 to 1937, quote, Mrs. J. Thompson was the first, fourth, and eighth librarian serving the library over 14 years during its first quarter of a century. The record of its progress is largely a record of the faithful work and intelligence lavished upon it by Mrs. Thompson, who was recognized as a leader in library affairs in the state. Her major interests were the children's department and work with the schools. The organization of a colored branch in the Lincoln School in 1926 was one of her achievements. And then here on this, we see the exterior of the Carnegie Library surrounded by various newspaper articles written by and about the library staff. <coughs> the three women mentioned here are just a few of the many volunteer women who were dedicated to building and maintaining institutions for the greater good of society. There were many others. Mary Smith, who ran a library out of her home without pay while the Carnegie Library was being built and was the first person to receive a library card in Chickasha. Kate Biggers, who solicited the first 100 books for the Carnegie Library in 1905. Grace Dorsey, the first librarian at Lincoln School, who provided Chickasha's black community with access to books during the 1930s and 1940s. Students from the Oklahoma College for Women, who helped with Vacation Reading Club and Children's, or Children's Story Hour, and countless library staff, volunteers, and community advocates who believed in the library and who were dedicated to providing information and resources to people. And the final sh slide shows a photo of the Chickasha Public Library taken in September 2022, and sources where you can read more information. Women volunteers were essentials to the establishment of the library, civic and cultural organizations, and education in Chickasha, as well as many early Oklahoma communities. They took on the challenge to provide infrastructure and created a sense of community and permanence that allowed communities to grow and flourish. Of course, it was not always a perfect system. The women who were able to affect change and create institutions were those who had the time and resources to do so. They were, for the most part, wealthy and more privileged than most women in rural Oklahoma, and they had access to education, social status, connections, and organizational influence. The institutions they created, as with anything created by people, reflected all the prejudices and biases of the creators, and they also existed in society that had segregation, inequality, and economic social problems, and all of the other problems of historic and modern life. However, the ideals that these women held on to transcended their immediate circumstances and looked into a future that was full of possibilities, because they knew that the public, goal, the public good was a worthy goal. That forward-thinking vision is why today we can affirm that libraries are for everyone, that information and resources should be accessible to all, and that libraries are essential to creating a more equitable and inclusive world, both now and into the future. Thank you. <laughs>